Psalm 51. Into verse 13. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in inward parts. And in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. <laughs> Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. There are 150 psalms. Roughly half of them were written by David. Out of the 75 psalms that he wrote, 18 of the psalms are autobiographical. Some of the psalms are prophetical. Some of the psalms are historical. Some are autobiographical. They're wrapped around his own life. Out of those 18 autobiographical psalms, there are seven penitential psalms. Out of the seven penitential psalms, there is one outstanding psalm of penitence and this surely is it if you notice there in verse 1 you have <coughs> pardon me in the first three verses you have three different words for sin at the end of verse, verse 1 he talks about transgressions <coughs> and, and then in the middle of verse 2 he talks about iniquity and in verse 3 he says my sin is ever before me for those three definitions of sin, there are three words for cleansing and purifying. Verse 1, he says, blot out. Verse 2, he says, wash me. And in the same verse, he says, cleanse me. If you read this psalm carefully, you discover there are three major prayers in it. Three times in this psalm, the psalmist mentions brokenness. Three times he mentions the Spirit. Three times he mentions sacrifice. Again, and three times he mentions brokenness. When we were in New York with David Wilkerson, there was a very controversial... Some call him a maverick conductor of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. His name was Leonard Bernstein. He broke about every law in the book. He did everything he shouldn't do when he was conducting, but he became extremely popular and he packed out the great auditoriums. In his own right, he's not only a great conductor, one of the world's greatest, he's also a very celebrated concert pianist. And one day somebody had been in Europe and they came back and they came and gave him a piece of dog eared paper and they said, look, this is, a, this is a very valuable manuscript. I gave a great sum of money for it. It was written more than 200 years ago. It was composed on one of those majestic organs in a great cathedral in Europe. I want you to sit down and play it for me. <laughs> Bernstein said, I can't do that. You can. No, I can't. You can, but you won't. I can't do it. Why not? Well, he said, if I could have climbed up behind that great organ and found all the moods and expressions of the man that was composing that piece of music, I might get somewhere near making a reasonable translation of it. 
But there's a gap of 200 years between the, the time that that majestic organ was, was swelling with a, with a marvelous composition, for it is a marvelous composition. But I would do it injustice if I tried to play it. Very often when I read the Word of God, I think of that. You know, sometimes I hear preachers read the Bible as though it were a weather report, and bad weather at that. <laughs> Dr. Luke Wiseman fulfilled with distinction the historic pulpit of John Wesley in London. I like to hear him preach because he would stop preaching and go to the piano and he could really make those keys dance. But he could read the scripture like nobody on earth. When he read the scripture, I often wish he'd say, and now the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost be there. He said so much by reading the Word of God. How in the world do you, do you, how in the world do you read a, a psalm like this of a broken-hearted man, a man in the most tragic experience of life, how can you read it when it was written thousands of years ago? I think sometimes if actors were to say their lines like preachers, they'd be fired the first week. If we were to read the scriptures like the actors, you'd say it was histrionics and we're trying to be dramatic. So you try reading this psalm ten different ways. The man that really wrote this psalm has a broken heart. He didn't dictate it to a pretty secretary. He didn't put it on an IBM machine. Oh, sure, this is printed on nice kind of rice paper. It's punctuated with commas and periods, and it, it, it's very well uh, uh, fixed up grammatically. The man who wrote the psalm wasn't concerned about grammar at all. He has no audience. This man is a broken-hearted man. He comes with the most amazing statements a man can make. He says, have mercy upon me. You can almost say the agony in his spirit, have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, blot out all my transgressions. What's his problem? Well, he did have a rebel son by the name of Absalom, but he has no problem with Absalom. Absalom tried to steal his crown and pull the throne from under him. This is not his problem here. He was always in a, having opposition from the Philistines. The Philistines are not, are not assailing him here. He, he says, have mercy upon me, that the bones which thou hast broken, maybe he hasn't got a broken bone in his body. A few years ago I jumped out of a burning hotel. It was 1951 actually. And I hit the sidewalk. Brought my back in three places. My left leg was in three pieces. My, my feet were shattered. And I lay in that alley outside of that burning hotel in snow at 3 o'clock in the morning in my pyjamas. No preacher should be out in his pyjamas that time in the morning. <laughs> You're going to get a chill. <laughs> and as I lay there, a man came around the corner and he said, What are you doing here? <laughs> I almost said, Playing tennis. Can't you see what I'm doing? <laughs> I was lying helpless. I could not get up. And he said, You can't stay here. An automobile may come round the corner and you'll get hurt. <laughs> I said, thank you. <laughs> he put his hand under my legs and under my back and he lifted me and when he did, oh, every bone that was broken screamed. And I, I, I actually bit the inside of my lip, a bit of hole in it because a British bulldog, you know, holds on, he never squeals. And I remember all those bones aching and aching and aching and I could feel the jarring of them. And David said this, but when there's a broken relationship with God, it's like having a broken bone. I need you to heal me, he said. I've got a broken heart and I've got a broken spirit. No, David did not write this psalm, dictating it to some charming person. He wrote this psalm on his face before God. He's sobbing, he's heartbroken. It's punctuated with groans, not periods and commas. It's punctuated with groans. After all, the greatest loss in life is not losing an arm or losing a friend or losing your fortune. It's losing relationship with God. No man walked closer to God than this man. 
Remember how he says in the 8th Psalm, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Well, we're still trying to find that out. A woman says she's found footprints of men uh, three and a half million years old. Well, a few days on either side, but uh, you've got to believe it because science says so. We spend millions and millions, we subsidize through the government, we subsidize people to go and do what they call archaeology. Does it matter a hill of beans where we came from? I believe in the biblical revelation. I believe that God made man. But the most important thing is not where we came from, it's where we're going that matters. The government won't give you ten cents to investigate that. <laughs> what is man that thou art mindful of him? I came into the house when I was a little boy one day and I, I was really crying. I was sobbing and my mother said, Len, what's wrong? And I said, Mother, the boys have been after me again. I was narrow-shouldered and skinny and a big head. And the boys nicknamed me Big Head. <laughs> and one day they teamed up on me and, 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 and they said, Big Head, Big Head, Big Head. And I ran home and Mother said, What's wrong? They're screaming, Big Head. Oh, Len, she thought she'd comfort me. She said, Don't bother, there's nothing in it. <laughs> discovered this week there's an awful lot in my head and in yours. I discovered that there's what? About um, 10,000 million things called neurons in your brain. 200 little roadways can meet on one neuron and you've got two, uh, two uh, what is it, I put a note here, uh, 10,000 million of them in your head. They're miniature computers. 200 little things can go feeding onto a neuron and, and they'll store up in your mind and they'll sort out and they'll collate and they'll, they'll put on records so that you can recall it at any minute. That's just, just one neuron can do that. You ought to be brainy around here. It says here that you've got a hundred, apparently you've got 10,000 million of them in your mind. You've got, supposed to have three and a half pounds of matter between here and here here and here, <clears throat> and uh, about three, uh, and then you've got all the other things that are there, you know. Yeah. The good book says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. I've not only got that, that uh, 10,000 million neurons in my mind. I've got 100,000 miles of blood vessels. I've got some things so delicately constructed in my personality that though the heavens declare the glory of God, there's nothing in it. They're not constructed like the human brain. And then you, can, you cannot fathom the human mind, you cannot fathom the human spirit. There's no x-ray can discover where your conscience is, or where your memory is, or where your bitterness is, or where your hatred is. With the most delicately constructed piece of fabulous mechanism in this world. Because when God had made the earth, he put man on it as his crowning creation and his crowning glory. So he not only writes in that eighth psalm, what is man, he writes the 23rd psalm. And if ever you go to Scotland, you must hear them sing it. Nobody can sing it like the Scots. It's a kind of national anthem with them. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You can imagine him on the hills of Bethlehem playing his harp in the coolness of the night, singing, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast done. What is man that art mindful of him? And then he recalls the mercy of God, goodness and mercy have followed me. He talks about going into the valley of the shadow of death. I often think he's recording his experience of going down to meet Goliath. He felt the awfulness. He was crowded in with hostility and hatred. There was a man on the earth who was prepared to do the job and a little fellow called David goes with a sling and a stone. He wrote the 139th Psalm. When he was living maybe as closely to God as any man ever lived, not only in his own experience, but in Psalm 139 he's right dead in line with the will of God and the purpose of God and his mind is set on doing everything that God says. And he says bravely, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me.
It was D.L. Moody who said that if God would give a man uh, the ability to invent a camera that would take a photograph of our heart, not many of us would sit for that photography, and when we got the picture, we wouldn't want to show it around. He says to the eternal God whose eyes are like a flame of fire, Search me, O God! Search me like you search Jerusalem with a candle, God says. I search Jerusalem. He says, search me. Search all my thoughts, the secret things, the motives that control, the chambers where polluted things hold empire over soul. Search till thy fiery glance hath cast these holy light through all, and I by grace am brought at last before thy face to fall. Search me, O God. That was when he was spiritually healthy. That was before that relationship was broken. That was when that heart and that voice and that spirit used to make glad the heart of God. So I don't care where you're searching the New Testament, you can talk as much as we like about the spirit for life, and so we should. Nobody ever hit the heights of praise like David, did they? He gets a prophetic view of Jesus coming in his glory, and he says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory, the Lord, strong and mighty? Isn't it amazing that this man who'd walk so near to God would forfeit it for a few minutes of pleasure in the flesh? Again, I remind you in that 139 Psalm, he says, Search me, O God. You notice he doesn't say that here, he says, Hide thy face from my sins. Not search me, hide thy face. Don't turn the blazing light of, on your, of your holiness on my corruption. He says another devastating thing. It took me years to find out what he was saying. I found out to my satisfaction at least when he said, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Why? Because prior to him that had been the first king of Israel. God didn't want them to have a king. But they wanted a king. And he gave them a king. They were going to be a theocracy, ruled by God. And they chose to be ruled in the flesh. And God granted their request that he sent leanness into their soul. And listen, if you push God far enough, sometimes because you're a petty and small and dwarf, he'll give you what you ask for, but you'll get leanness. He granted their request, but he sent leanness into their souls. And they had the most handsome man in the world. He was tall, dark, handsome, like the novelists say. He was head and shoulders above everybody in Israel. <clears throat> One day, with all the pomp and circumstance, they took a, a horn of a beast full of oil and they put it on his head. The oil is the consistent type of the Holy, uh, Holy Spirit in the Scriptures. And those drops of oil came upon the head of Saul. And not only was he filled with the Spirit, he had gifts of the Spirit because he prophesied, but he died of suicide. God took his Spirit from him. And instead of walking with God, he's groveling at the feet of some dirty, spiritist medium. And he says in his despair, could you bring up Saul? Tell me, could you bring up Samuel the prophet? The only time of any genuine... The return of the Spirit, as far as I'm concerned. And he thought we were, I was on good terms with, with, with Samuel, and it won't go as badly with me. But notice what he says to him. He says, Saul. So, he says, Samuel. Oh, no, he doesn't say, appeal to my God or our God. He says, ask of your God. He knew God had deserted him. He says, God hath forsaken me. And he says, God hath forsaken thee. That's the most tragic thing in the world as far as I'm concerned. We have men over this nation. I remember preaching in Australia. There was a fine, handsome man sitting over on the right. The preacher whispered to me, you see that man a bit bald there with that wonderful face? He was the most anointed man on this continent and now he's backslidden. He just came to hear an Englishman for a change. But he's no interest in the things of God. Oh, how tragic. The high road of Christian living is strewn with has-beens. They have been great. 
They were once Samson's. They pulled down the pillars and they wrestled against lions. <clears throat> the lion being a type of the devil. And Samson with his anointing tore up that lion. For God said, after all, didn't he? I give you power over all the power of the enemy. <clears throat> Pardon me. And, and he demonstrated that power. David had his fun. Satan, they used to tell us as kids, always finds something for idle hands to do. And if David had gone to war with the rest of the people, he'd never have got into this mess. But he sent others to fight the battle, and then he envied the girl that was nude over there. And he watched her and watched her, and he coveted her. He committed adultery with her, and then he sent a note to the captain, see that this young man, her husband, gets to the front of the battle where he's sure to get killed. And so he did what we all do. Committed sin, and committed another sin to cover the sin. And here he is. My darling mother died with cancer. Her last few weeks were terrible. <clears throat> she was a saintly, godly woman. But in the last few days, a few weeks, particularly the last few days, she was in agony. And I've heard people say, and you have, that this is the most devastating of all pains. No, no, there's one pain greater than that. It's not physical. It's in the soul. It's in the spirit. We get emotionally torn. The Roman church has played on the fact that wherever you go there's a crucifix with big splashes of red blood to imitate the death of Jesus, his agony, his, his blood from his feet and his hands, and we sing, see from his head, his hands, his feet. But that was not the death. Isaiah 53 does not talk about the physical suffering. He says, Thou hast made his soul an offering for sin. The psalmist says, Elsewhere the pains of hell got hold of me. And day something here is suffering the most excruciating pain, the pain of a broken heart separated from God. There is no balm in Gilead. There is no physician. You're going to have to come like everybody else and say, Nothing in my hands I bring. Why is he feel so perturbed about this? He's the most popular man in the world. He hit the top of the chart with his psalms. <coughs> People used to sing, Saul has slain his thousands. And they changed it and sang, But David is tens of thousands. You've seen Saul? <coughs> Saul's nothing, com <coughs> nothing compared to David. <coughs> ah, yes. But there's no music inside now. I say he's going to have to come eventually and say, Nothing in my hands I bring. He still rules an empire. He still has soldiers. He's still a millionaire. He still lives in a palace. He still has servants. Forget it. You'll get over this. He says, no, 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 no. To lose my relationship with God. And I've been increasingly impressed, as I've read recently, convinced of the wonderful fact of this, that the greatest man that ever lived, not only a king, but the king of kings, he never had a penny. He had to borrow one one day for an illustration. In his greatest sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount, he never blessed a material thing. And he never left a material thing when he died. He shut up totally to the eternal, the spiritual things. And you know what usually happens? It's happened in America as well as other countries. The richer we get in the church, the poorer we get in spirit. Right now we've got too many powder puff evangelists. <clears throat> There's not much that's very dynamic going on. Dave Wilkerson talked with me the other day on the phone. He said, Len, I've just had a phone call from Chicago. A fellow there says there's been a great prophecy given that within a very short time, <clears throat> the nation, America, is going to be split ripped right down the center with the greatest earthquake we've ever known, maybe the world has ever known. You can put that on the headlines and you can put it on every TV screen this week. They'll turn to a ball match, they'll watch some other idiotic thing, you can't warn people. Well, I don't know so much about that earthquake, but I know we need a spiritual earthquake very badly. And God has said, yet, just before the end time, yet just once more I will shake the heavens and the earth. 
David has found that there's a price to pay for sin. Sure, he had his fun with Bathsheba. And now, every time he, he hears a baby cry, one of his servants has a little baby there in the cradle as, she, as she's making meals, and the baby cries, and it stabs his spirit. He looks out and sees a soldier on guard, and he remembers he put one of the finest men in the army to death, and he says, My sin is ever before me. If there's one thing we need in the States right now, above anything else, it's something we don't talk too much about these days. We need a mighty avalanche of conviction of sin. The gospel is never as cheap. You just come out, weep on the shoulder of the preacher and say you're sorry. The sinner's prayer, as they say, God be merciful to me, a sinner, and you're in. This is what you get. <clears throat> Eternal life, a mansion on Main Street, a five-decker crown, a free ticket to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and rule over five cities. That's an awful lot when you've sinned for 30 years and it only takes 30 seconds to get that bunch of stuff, eh? Except it's not true. Not for everybody. I was talking the other day to some folk about W.P. Nicholson, the great Irish evangelist. <clears throat> He's the most devastating evangelist I've ever heard. Some meetings that, that people with and, and the conviction of sin, they'd have hymn books in their hands and, and they'd be shredding them and there were piles of hymn books on the floor. One man told me I went in to hear his jokes. He's an awful man for telling jokes. We told him in a subtle way he'd go into a stately Presbyterian church holding 1,500 people and before ever he said a thing he'd put his Bible and hymn book down and say, Nicholson, God have mercy on you tonight. This is the greatest collection of hypocrites in this, in this city for a hundred years. Now that's a nice way to start a meeting with cultured Presbyterians, isn't it? Pentecostals would hardly stand for that, never mind Presbyterians. <laughs> You know, that man could so work on a congregation that th this man said to me, I went in a drunkard, I was a blasphemer, I was one of the most unclean men in Ireland. And before he finished, sweat was dropping off my nose and off the end of my chin, and I said, God, if I ever get out, I'll never hear this idiot again. But I was there the next night. And he said, when I came out the second night, I said, what a fool I was. That man scared me to death. I didn't know whether he put hell in me or scared it out of me, but he says, I'll tell you one thing, you couldn't pay me thousands of pounds to come and hear him another night, but I was there the next night, he said. And I said, away back in the gallery. And he said, when he said, look, there's mercy if you can. He said, there was a stampede to the altar. We were like a herd of buffaloes going down, and there were men cursing as they went to the altar. They didn't know any better. <laughs> Some nights he'd cut the meeting off and say, go home. Some nights he'd stand up and say, stand up, and they'd sing, God save our gracious king. <clears throat> oh, we talk about predestination, we talk about trusting God, but we squeeze some meetings as though God needs an awful lot of help. <coughs> we don't know too much these days anymore about conviction of sin. David is burdened, David is baffled, David is broken, David is bleeding. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. This is the first prayer. It reminds me so often of days in Teen Challenge, I may have told you before, I, I took the chapel service one, one morning. When I went in, there was a tiny little Puerto Rican fellow, and he said, Mr. Raiden, I've come. He's going to lead the service. Before he, he speaks, let's sing the national anthem. And I thought, oh heavens, national anthem, get out of here. <laughs> what do you want to sing the national anthem for in a gospel service? And this side had about, a, I get about 80 girls, gorgeous girls, all prostitutes. This side had a bunch of anything you like. Black men, white men, all kinds of men. <coughs> They're all bad men. Mostly redeemed. And he got up and the little fellow says, now we sing, we sing our national anthem. So I got, you know, started to sing and, and they sang the national anthem. Their national anthem. Do you know what it was? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I've never heard it sung as good. 
before we finished the first stanza, every girl's blouse was wet with tears. And even those boys were... You know, men don't like to wipe their eyes, so they run them down the sleeve like this, you know. And they were standing there, <laughs> running the tears down their sleeves. And, and before we got there, and then at the end, the little fellow said, we sing again the last verse. When we've been there 10,000 years... No, no, no. We sing that. We sing that. When we've been there, ten million years. <laughs> well, that won't put a strain on the clock of eternity either, whether it's ten thousand or ten million. You see, this man, this man is so sordid. He's so corrupt. He's so conscious that God has every right to cast him into hell. Do you wonder he writes afterwards? He lifted me out of a horrible pit. You say, well, I was never like that. I was a clean Methodist or a good Pentecost or something. Look, fellow, I don't care whether I lifted you out of hell or not. You were going to hell if he hadn't saved you. <clears throat> and you could go to hell at the communion table as well as the gambling table. He lifted me. He never forgot it. It wasn't what he did for Israel. It wasn't what he did for other nations. He lifted me with my rebellion and my sin. <laughs> I preached one night. In 1932, in a church in England, the senior pastor was Dr. Fawcett, I think the most brilliant preacher I ever heard in my life. He was going out of town and he said, Len, you're to preach on Sunday night. And we always got a packed auditorium. I looked over to the right and there was a very famous character. She's sitting on the usual two seats she sat on. <coughs> Well, she's so big she needed two seats anyhow. <coughs> Excuse me. She was the most notorious sinner in town. She used her husband as a punch bag. She knocked him out so many times he couldn't even keep count. She got into a brawl in the tavern. <coughs> A man said some dirty word to her and she, she pulled her fist back and uh, she just sucked him one and he was out cold. They called the police so she waited around the door and as the cop came up she just hit him like that. There were two of them there. Muhammad Ali never knocked two out in two hits. <laughs> but she knocked them both out. She waited for me at the end of the service. I want to talk with you. I said, go ahead. Oh, not now, she said. Not now. Wait till everybody's gone. I thought, boy, <clears throat> everybody's gone. <laughs> mm. And they all went, and I stood there, and I, uh, she said, not here, in the church office. I said, all right. <clears throat> I went in the church office. I said, S please sit. No, no, she said. Shut the door, put her arms up like this, behind the door. You couldn't see the door, so I knew I had no chance of getting out. <coughs> I said, what's your problem? What's my problem? She said, you, you, you held me up for ridicule tonight. You were talking about drunkards and liars and people who won't forgive and other things. Everybody knew you meant me. I said, I never thought it. No, 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 she said, you don't say that. I had preached that night, if you will not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. She looked straight at me and said, Ray, Neil, I haven't spoken to one neighbor for five years, I haven't spoken to the other for three years, and I'll go to hell before I'll speak to either of them. I said, good, you go to hell, I'm going to bed. <laughs> She didn't move from the door, and I said, sure, I wasn't going to try and move, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I waited a bit, and she said, I am not going to forgive my neighbors. I said, you've already told me that. And again, she said, I'll go to hell first. I said, well, I've told you, go to hell, I'm going to bed. I thought, well, I must be a prisoner for the rest of the night. I don't know how I'll get out of this place. So I just bent down and I, I prayed. And suddenly I heard a crash. Almost like a building falling. She was on her knees. <laughs> sobbing. She had a big handbag. She took out cigarettes and matches and movie tickets and lipstick. And I don't know what in the world she didn't take out. I thought, boy, this is a place for a woman to clear a handbag of all places. Start tidying that mess up. 
I said to her, excuse me, but what's this all about? And you know what she said? I've never forgotten it. She says, if I'm coming to Jesus, I'm coming clean. Isn't that great? You see, you bought, bought bundles of tickets for the movie house. She had a bundle, she had a cigarette, she had a matches, she had a lipstick, she had all kinds of things. I won't need those anymore. You know, that woman got saved that night. As a result of that, her husband got saved a few weeks after. A few weeks after, he was killed in the coal mine. And she was waiting at our door one morning. At least she knocked on the door about nine o'clock and said, I want to tell you my husband got killed in the coal mine last night. I, I, and, and I'm so happy. I thought, happy? What, you got rid of him? She said, no, 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 no. I, I'm so happy because he got saved. You see, if I hadn't have forgiven my neighbor, I wouldn't have got saved, and he wouldn't have got saved. I don't know how to raise the family, <clears throat> but she said, he's forgiven me. God has forgiven me. Doesn't Jesus talk about those who have been saved from much? They love much. <coughs> the thing is, we forget, God had to keep provoking Israel. Remember, that was the bondsman in Egypt. Suppose God hadn't in, intervened in your life, say, a month ago, a year ago, two years ago. Why would you be? You might be a derelict. You might be a prostitute this morning. You might be in jail somewhere. You might already be in hell. Do you wonder the hymn writer says, When all thy mercies, O oh my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view I'm lost in wonder, love, and praise. <clears throat> Tony spoke the other morning, I got great blessed bless when he was uh, telling us how the psalmist is trying to provoke people, push them on, all oh, that men would praise the Lord. Boy, we, we complain a lot quicker than we praise, I think, don't we? And while he was saying it, I was thinking of an old hymn written by Horatius Bonner. Oh, for a heart to pray. No, no, Charles Wesley wrote that. Praise to the holiest in the height. Was that it? And in the depth be praised. In all his works, more wonderful, more sure in all his ways. Now that isn't the one because Newman wrote that. <clears throat> I got it now. Fill thou my life, O Lord my God. The three great Scottish hymn writers, brothers, Andrew Bonner, Horatius Bonner, wrote this. Fill thou my life, O Lord my God, in every part with praise, that my whole being may proclaim thy being and thy ways. Not for the lip of praise alone, <clears throat> nor in a praising heart, I ask, <clears throat> but for a life made up of praise in every part. Praise in the common things of life. It's going out and in. Praise in each duty and each deed, however small and mean. So shall no part of day or night from sacredness be free. But all my life, in every step, be fellowship with thee. You know, this psalm, it says, on an instrument of ten strings will I praise thee. I wonder what it was. Guitars don't have ten strings, so it wasn't that. Well, let's suggest it was this, this instrument. Ten strings, two hands, two eyes, two feet, that makes six, doesn't it? Two lips. What about the other two strings? My heart and my mind. Upon the instrument of my personality, let it all be in subjection to thee. For after all, God gets out of this man, he plays on the strings of his, inst uh, of his uh, intellect and, and his emotions and his heart until he writes all these rhapsodies and all these amazing things. Right through the 75 Psalms he composed. <clears throat> he prays not only the prayer of a sinner, have mercy upon me, O God. But he prays another prayer, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. A critic went to see people going to church in England a while ago. He said, I drew up at the side of one of the historic churches and I watched people go in. And really, they looked as though they were going to the dentist. He said, I watched them come out. They looked as though they'd been. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I don't think necessary you have to walk sky high and be full of praise and adoration. I think there are times when God humbles us and we might walk out of the sanctuary humiliated and heavy in spirit. But by and large, there is no joy. You see, when there is no joy, you have to fill the gap up with entertainment. And the more joy you have in God, the less entertainment you need outside of yourself. Doesn't it say in the twelfth of Isaiah, with joy shall ye draw water from the... Who had more joy than the psalmist? He climbed the steeps of heaven. Senses the majesty of God. 
But when he gets into this situation, there's an emptiness. He's longing again for the Holy Spirit to come. Notice he says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, and therefore he convicts of error. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of life, he convicts of death. He's the Spirit of power, he convicts of weakness. He's the Spirit of fire, he convicts of coldness. He's the Spirit of joy, he convicts of sadness and heaviness and bondage. David's run up and down that scale like no other man, I believe, in all history. You know, some people wonder why Christians get excited. But I'll tell you, once you've had the experience, you don't wonder about it. You wonder sometimes how easily we grieve the Holy Spirit of God and uh, our joys are withered all and dead, as Charles Wesley says. They're fearfully and wonderfully made. I know there's somebody working on a bulldozer over there. Well, you know, a bulldozer could go over me. It wouldn't even know it had gone over me. But if you were shooting one of those rockets up into the sky there, and it had a grain of sand or half a grain of sand in it, it could put that rocket off course a hundred thousand miles in space. One little grain of sand. Half a grain of sand. Getting in that thing at the wrong place could could send it off course. You know, the closer we walk with God, the more we realize how easy it is to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. If He has put more wisdom into you, if He's put more strength into you, He's given more revelation to you, it's a stewardship. Watch it, guard it. I've not done much mountain climbing. I climbed the Grampians in Scotland once, and I found this. The higher you go up the mountain, the lonelier it is, and the air gets more rare. And I discovered a very simple thing. You can climb a mountain for three days and get near the edge. You know, you'd hardly believe this. It doesn't take you three days to hit the valley. <laughs> I don't know how long it takes, and I'm not going to try for sure. But it's an amazing thing, isn't it? You know, if you drop two things from a great height, one weighs a pound and the other weighs a hundred pounds, they both hit the ground at the same time. Einstein proved that. What I'm saying is this. It's easy to get out of that very, very intimate relationship with God. I was preaching in Ohio many years back, 20 years back again. A beautiful girl came to the altar one night amongst a lot of other folk. It was a snowy night, I remember it well. And I prayed with some men and I saw this girl with a gorgeous golden braids come down to the front. And she sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And I had prayed with men till about 11 o'clock and I was ready to go home and somebody said, Would you help us with this girl? And I said, My dear, there's a time to weep and a time to refrain from weeping, as the book says. What's your problem? I've lost my joy. Oh, you lost it. Uh-huh. Why did you lose it? People quote the scripture, Thou hast, we've lost our first love. It doesn't say that. It says you left it. 